Last year, I made a video where I detailed out what I thought was the outfit in this painting of Mrs. William Townsend's masquerade dress. I'll link that video in the description in case you haven't seen it yet. This year, I'm going to the Labyrinth Masquerade in Los Angeles, and what a perfect opportunity to recreate this gown. But since this video is going to be on the longer side, let's go ahead and get started. I decided to start with the skirt. It's pretty simple, it's just a black silk taffeta base, but then it has these like vertical red stripes that to my eye look like they're trying to imitate slashed uh, sleeves or the, the slashing that was popular all over clothing in the Elizabethan time period. Um, so I don't think I wanna make them by actually slashing the black silk taffeta. Instead, what, I, what I'm going to do is make these strips of a red silk taffeta and attach them to the top of the skirt. This is because I just don't really think that the red would like poke through the black very well. And even if you look up close on the portrait, it doesn't really look like they're coming up through the fabric, but rather that they are puffs of red sitting on top of the black. So that's what I'm doing here, just measuring out that um, red silk taffeta and using my fabric chalk to mark off even strips, which I will then cut out. I used fabric chalk to mark off those vertical lines on the petticoat where I'm going to place the red fabric. And I decided to do one, two, three vertical strips on both the front and the back panels. And then after constructing the panels uh, together, then I'll add another two for to cover the side seams. And this is what that first puff looked like once I had sewn it down by hand. With three of those red puff strips sewn both to the front and back of the black petticoat, it was time to attach the two pieces together. So I laid them out on the floor. Thankfully, my petticoat was going selvage edge to selvage edge. So I was able to lay them right sides together and then just do a regular straight seam up the sides, leaving about 10 to 12 inches free at the top for pocket access. With both side seams sewn, I needed to now attach the red puffs over the seam, and I wanted it to hide the side seams exactly. So I'm using my chalk here to measure out and make sure that I'm going to place that red fabric directly on the seam, and then measuring out the distance between each puff so I know where to gather the fabric down. Then I'm placing the red fabric strip on top it already has both edges ironed underneath, so no raw edges will be exposed. And then I'm just sort of scrunching the fabric up to create the puffed shape that I want and pinning it in place. When I reach the area at the top of the petticoat, which has the opening for the pocket, I'm just making sure to kind of scoot the red fabric over to one side and I chose to have it be on the front side because that fabric piece will be overlapping the back fabric piece so I want that red puff to be nice and visible. With the red puff pinned in place I used a prick stitch down each side of the puff to hold it in place and I wound my thread a couple of times around each of the gathered areas just to make sure that those gathered parts of the puff would hold in place. The rest of the petticoat follows normal 18th century petticoat construction methods with pleating of the front and the back and adding a waistband. Next, it was time to pattern the bodice and I'm using my bodice pattern that I made for my Annalise Outlander uh, outfit last year. So I'm tracing that onto paper and then just adding some additional style lines to the front. And the front of the bodice has this sort of V-shaped section which is outlined in gold trim that goes from the center front point of the bodice at the waist all the way up to Kind of like the inner corner of the uh, where the shoulder meets the arm 
And so I thought maybe I could just apply the gold trim over top of a solid piece of bodice, but I thought it would be really hard to get it symmetrical on both sides if I did that and thought it would be much easier if I actually just made it two separate pieces of fabric from the get-go. So I'm just kind of eyeballing what shape and what line I think uh, looks best and looks nice and curving that um, so that it starts and ends in the right spot. I also wanted the center front to dip down a little bit further than my Annalise bodice did, so I went ahead and made that adjustment as well. And then I made sure to mark off little matching lines on that uh, style line so that when I cut it out, I can be sure to match up the points exactly where they need to go. The skirt of the Annalise bodice was a total of four pieces. so one front left, one back left, one back right, one front right. Uh, but this skirt needs to be a total of eight pieces. So I just took the Annalise skirt, slightly modified the shape to accommodate the increased dip at the waist, and then split it into two pieces. I then repeated this with the back pattern piece. As always, I'm using linen for my lining pieces, so cutting those out first by marking on the linen with my water-soluble fabric pen, and then cutting those lining pieces out. After stitching the lining pieces together by machine, I just did a quick try-on to make sure I had the right shapes before cutting into the silk velvet. I repeated the same basic process with this silk velvet fabric, now, this is the first time that I had worked with silk velvet. Well, really the first time I'd worked with any velvet. And let me tell you, I'm not sure if I know when the next time will be because this fabric is super hard to work with. I laid the fabric uh, front side down so that I could use my chalk marker on the sort of flatter back side of the fabric. But even then, that pile of the velvet just makes the fabric move and shift at the slightest touch. So it was really difficult to get my shapes marked accurately. That same quality of the fabric that made it really difficult to mark on and cut out also made it really difficult to sew. I found that for a straighter seam, it was actually easiest not to pin the fabric together, but rather to just manually hold it and sort of adjust the tension of the top and bottom as I stitched on my machine. However, for more curved seams, it was near impossible to sew on the machine. So for the super curved seams, I did a lot of hand stitching after meticulously pinning in place. Next, I added boning to the lining of the bodice, and this is the same type of boning that I've used in the past that comes in the sort of like very rigid uh, bone casing that extends out to either side. And although it's rigid, it sort of feels like soft and velvety, and you can definitely get a needle through it. I actually really enjoy using this type of boning in a bodice lining because I can hand stitch it in place without having to worry about uh, putting a bone casing in and it's going to lock in really securely and that bone is not going to shift around at all. Next I laid the lining down on top of the fashion fabric and pinned it in place before using pin pricks along each of the seam lines to hold it in place. And along the top neckline edge, I made sure that both the lining and the silk velvet had their edges turned in towards the center. And this is so that we don't have any raw fabric showing towards the outside. I also made sure that the silk velvet overhangs the lining a little bit so that the lining will not be seen from the outside. And we don't have to worry about this on the bottom edge because that edge is going to get the skirt pieces attached to it later. Okay, so we've run into a fitting issue. It appears that the velvet is much scratchier than the linen lining layer. So what is happening, you can see on this side here, if I pull that to where it's gonna be closed, it's quite loose. Like there's a, there's kind of a bunch of 
extra floating around. And it's right at this side seam area that is just, I don't know if you can see it very well, but there's just too much like extra fabric going on. Yeah, it's like pulling on the back there. So the plan is to unpick the seam and the velvet on the side, pull from the back and make sure that it's actually laying completely flat and stitch that down and then lay this down on top of it and do the little prick stitch as you would with like traditional 18th century construction methods like I did with my chocolate girl bodice. So that's the plan. Hopefully it fixes this issue. I just, it's like, it's way too loose. All this like hanging out here on the side, like that's just, that's not a good look. I did exactly that plan. I unpicked the stitches from that side seam and then make sure to smooth the fabric out from the back all the way as far as it will go towards the front before sewing that in place. And I used a ton of pins to make sure that this fabric was holding in place and was really as tight against the lining fabric as I could get it. Next, I did the same thing, but starting from the center front of the bodice, smoothing out the fabric as much as I can and pinning it in place all the way back to that center uh, seam underneath the arm. And then this time before I pin the center seam in place, I'm just gonna fold the edge of the fabric back on itself so that that raw edge is underneath the fold. And I did take my scissors and cut off the extra fabric there so I wouldn't have a lot of that bulk uh, underneath the, the outside layer. Then I did the usual prick stitch to secure the fabric down. My favorite trick for an 18th century center front closing bodice is to use hook and eye tape. This is, of course, not historically accurate at all, but it's really easy to install and it also makes it a lot easier to get in and out of the garment without having to pin everything in place. Next, I tackled the patterning of the sleeves. I really liked how my Annalise Outlander bodice sleeves fit, so I took the sleeve pattern that I had used for that and copied it down onto a fresh sheet of paper. Now those sleeves ended uh, about at the elbow with a cuff on top of them to extend them. The sleeves for this masquerade outfit need to be down to the wrist and they are just long sleeves um, that are thin and tight against the arm. Now of course they can't be too tight because we, then we wouldn't have enough arm mobility. Another difference in the sleeves is that the Outlander sleeve was designed to only have one seam down the center front, but because these sleeves need to have that gold trim going down the front and the back, I wanted to put a seam down the front and the back as well so that it would be easy to follow along and apply the trim. So after tracing out my basic uh, sleeve shape, I just located that front and back area and divided the sleeve in half. Now, long sleeves in the 18th century, because the fabric is not stretchy at all and the sleeves are often fitted tighter, these sleeves tend to have a bend and a shaping at the elbow because when we have our arms down straight by our sides, our arms aren't actually perfectly straight. We tend to bend them inwards a little little bit at the elbow. So I had to measure down and, and locate the elbow point on the sleeve pattern and add in a little uh, angle there to accommodate that. To make sure that that angle matched on both the front and back pieces of the sleeve, I took my first uh, top part of the sleeve and traced that out and then just laid the, um, the under sleeve on top of that 
so that I could cut out that sort of like underarm shape while keeping the rest of the sleeve exactly the same shape so that that way I knew that that, uh, that bend at the elbow would match up from front to back. With my sleeve pattern decided on, I cut it out of both the lining fabric and that horrible silk velvet again. I have managed to do something ridiculous, which of course something always happens on a project. It can never go smoothly. I have managed to cut the same, I've managed to cut two left sleeves out of my really expensive silk velvet fabric. So let's just take a look at what that looks like. See, two of the same sleeve. How I managed to do this, I don't know because I was thinking about doing it correctly literally the entire time I was cutting. So thankfully I have enough more fabric that I can cut another one and maybe I can use this uh, extra one and cut it up and use it for at least one of the little like cap sleeve sections. That's what I'm hoping, hoping it'll be big enough for that so I don't have to waste it. Once I had all my sleeve pieces cut correctly, I sewed the lining fabric first by machine. Then because that velvet was so slippery, I decided to lay the velvet down with right side down and then lay that stitched lining piece on top of it, pin it in place without moving it, and then hand stitch right along the seam, tacking the velvet down. Then I laid the second piece of velvet sleeve over top, making sure to properly align all the edges. And then I pinned it down right on the center so that it wouldn't move. Then I rotated it so that the seam was facing up and inserted a ruler so that I would have a hard surface to stitch against so that I would know I wasn't stitching through more layers of the sleeve than I intended. And next I pinned the velvet down so I left one side of the velvet just laying flat against the lining and then the top layer of velvet I rolled the edge under so that I would have that nice folded under edge to stitch along. And then I pinned all of that down in place. For the second seam, I decided that my little quilter's clips worked better than pins, so I just clipped all the edges down and then used a whip stitch uh, right along the edge there. And the whip stitch worked out perfectly fine. You can't see the stitches because the pile of the velvet hides them. To hem the sleeves, I folded both the lining and the velvet towards the inside and then used a little whip stitch right along the edge of the lining on the inside of the sleeve to stitch that down. Okay, so the sleeves are in on the underside and you can see what that looks like here. So it's just a back stitch running all along the underarm of the sleeve, connecting the bodice to the sleeve and as is period correct, this raw edge just gets to stay raw. So the next step now is to try it on and pin the upper part of the sleeve to the lining sleeve strap like that. Okay, I lied. Actually, before finishing the top of the sleeve, I realized that I needed to add whatever trim I was going to add so that that trim would go up into the sleeve uh, seam and be nice. So I had this, um, this gold uh, pointy triangle trim that I had searched for ages to find on Etsy and found something that I thought looked similar to what I think are probably spangles on the original uh, gown from the portrait. So I just pinned these right along the seam lines that I wanted to accent and then used a prick stitch to stitch them down. Okay y'all, I seriously debated whether or not I should leave this footage in the video, but I decided to leave it in because I wanted you to see how ridiculous it was the first time that I tried this gown on 
after sewing the sleeves. I realized that I made the sleeves ever so slightly too small around the wrists. And so to this day, when I put this jacket on, it is such a mess of trying to get it to sit right. Once it's on, it's fine and I can move around, but it's just really, really finicky trying to like get it to lay properly over my shoulders and down my arms and to get my hands through the edge of the sleeve. Uh, so yeah, in, enjoy the struggle. Okay, so also during that first fitting, one thing I realized was that my sleeves were not sitting at the correct angle. So I went back and unstitched the bottom of the sleeve and tried the gown on with um, the sleeve completely unstitched so that I knew exactly how it needed to sit and at what angle to sit. Um, then I went back and I corrected the other side to match it. And one thing that I don't love is that that made the actual seam of the sleeve, which has the gold accent on it, sit higher so that it doesn't really connect to the seam line from the bodice and it doesn't connect in the back either. So it's a small, you know, small detail that will bother me forever. But in the end, because of the little Jacobian sleeve caps that I'm going to add, I don't think that it, um, it doesn't stand out to the eye too much. Speaking of the sleeve caps, with the sleeves taken care of and stitched down, it was time to pattern out the sleeve caps and decide what shape worked best. So I started with a piece of paper and just made a horizontal line and then a vertical line to mark that center point and sketched out a curve to connect those, those points. And I tried to make it wide enough to kind of cover my shoulder and like sit out over the shoulder so that it would be pronounced and noticeable. I then folded the paper in half when I cut out the curve so that I would be sure that the two sides were symmetrical. Then I realized that that first pattern was going to be way too big and was going to give me giant like 80s uh, shoulder pad shoulders. So I made a much narrower version and then instead of having it be completely flat and horizontal on the bottom edge, I made it curve a little bit so that it would better follow the lines of the armhole seam. I used that template to cut out my linen lining fabric and then used the lining itself as my template to cut out the velvet. And then I sewed it up along the curved edge, leaving the straighter edge that will meet the shoulder open. Then with the bodice on my dress form, I was able to place each of the shoulder cap pieces in place and pin them down. And this was how I got them to sit right along the seam line and also to be even and cover the same amount of space front to back. Then with the garment still on my dress form, I used a prick stitch to stitch them down in place. Next, I used quilting clips to secure the shoulder strap down over top of the lining and the shoulder cap. As I did this, I made sure to fold the edges under to the inside along all the edges, and then I used pins to secure the seam right along the shoulder cap since I didn't have the open edge that the quilting clips would fit around. The bodice is almost done. Now all I need to do is cut out the pieces for the skirt panels. So I used my pattern that I had made in the beginning and cut out the linen lining for each of the skirt panel pieces. Then I used those lining pieces as my template to cut out the velvet. At this point, I realized that I needed the skirt to have a little bit more body than it was going to have with just the velvet and the lining. So I got some fusible interfacing uh, marked out my seam allowance on it and um, fused that down to the velvet. Then that interfaced edge was stiff enough that I was able to roll the velvet in over that edge and use my quilting clips to keep it down. After creasing the edges of the seam allowance from my lining inwards, I was able to lay that down over the velvet 
and clip that in place with the quilting clips as well. So then I was able to hand stitch around all those edges uh, so that I would have a nice lined piece where the stitches weren't going to show through on the front, but also where that lining would not um, show around to the front. I needed the lining to be ever so slightly smaller than that outer uh, fashion fabric. So then here is what all the skirt pieces look like when sewn, and here is what they look like with the trim. I attached the skirt pieces by stitching by hand to the velvet of the bodice first, and then once that was done, I was able to flip them to the inside and fold the lining down over top of them and stitch that down as well. I added the final bits of trim around the waistline, neckline, and then the little military-esque loop pieces that march down the front of the bodice. In the portrait, there is lace poking out at the sleeves and at the bodice, which I think is probably coming from an undershirt of some kind, but I want to make it easy on myself and actually just add the lace to the bodice here. So I'm just trying to decide which lace I like better, and I think I like the one on the right. We're on the home stretch now. I'm trying on the gown to see the final fit, and I'm looking at the skirt, and I just, something seems off. I don't like it. Remember how when I patterned this skirt, I said, I think the one in the portrait is a circular skirt, but I wanted to make the wide um, hoop skirt look uh, that I like from, from you know, other forms of 18th century dress. Well, here, I just don't think it's giving the right look. It looks very boxy and not very elegant. So... I decided to modify the petticoat by cutting it off into a straight line at the top, regathering it and adding the waistband back on. So what this is going to do is just gonna make it a regular circular petticoat and get rid of the space that those side pocket hoops take up in the initial petticoat design. And with that, we are done. I finished it just in time to wear it to the Labyrinth Masquerade Ball in Los Angeles. And didn't it turn out beautiful? Let me know in the comments what historical painting you think I should try next. <laughs>